All right. Uh, so today, what I want to do, I uh, want to uh, review what we've talked about so far. We've got a few warm up questions just to kind of uh, get us thinking about um, uh, like the different quantities we're taking. Um, after that, let's go ahead and take questions on the homework. I didn't put that one here. So we'll do warm up questions, then take questions on the homework. Um, and then we're going to talk today about uh, two new concepts. Fork and moment of inertia, um, and then we're going to do some practice. Uh, so, looking ahead, just a reminder: uh, projects presentations start April seventh. Um, that is the Wednesday after spring break. Um, and then uh, I'm looking at a homework quiz next time I see you on just those first two sessions. So, just uh, I'm doing the homework quiz early in this unit because kind of. So that's going to happen next time I see you. And then uh, after today, you'll also be able to do the second two parts of the syllabus. Um, I opened up test questions last class. If you want to do test questions, uh, get those done later. Well, let's go ahead and start with some warm up questions. Um, all right, I got four questions here. Um, I want you to talk to your uh, your partner about each of these. What uh, so first question? What symbol is measured in radians? When I say symbol, I mean on your equation sheet, which symbol? Right? What does that little scripty L stand for? What symbol would it be if I was uh, talking about eighteen revolutions? And what symbol would it be if I was talking about thirteen hundred RPMs? So uh, tell your partner what you think about those. All right, Gianni, what uh, symbol are you reading? Or what is it look like? You know? Or if you're not doing anything, what does it look like? Say again. Uh, uh, pi is, so there are two pi radians in a revolution, but that's not what I would say the symbol is. Like if I was plugging into the equation, that no one would see the radius. What's the radius? Uh, yeah. Now this is, yeah. Theta, theta, right? Angle is theta. Radians are an angle. Angle is theta, right? Um, so we'll start with if I'm talking about radians, that's a theta. Um, Becky, what is scripty all stand for? Arc length. Okay, measured in what? Meters. Yep. Okay. Uh, all right. What symbol would be best to use if I had eighteen revolutions? Emily. Yes, right. So what you do if you were given 18 revolutions, right? You would convert it to radians first, and then it would be theta. Yep. Uh, this last one is the one I don't know that I actually explicitly said in this one, uh, but maybe you can figure out. 1300 RPM in there. Tell me what 1300 RPM is most likely. It's omega, yeah. So what you'd want to do is, if you're given 1300 RPM, you'd want to convert it to radians per second first, right? And then convert to RPM. If you look at your equation, you right, I've got the two conversions that you need to use in this unit. Now. I've got the RPM to radians per second conversion, and I also have the radian revolution conversion. Um, you might, uh, well, you might just jot yourself a note here. Um, uh, 
So, well, maybe I'll just I'll just go to what we were talking about before, right? So, uh, even though theta, to, to plug it into equation, right, we need theta to be measured in radians, right? We can also we can also get to radians if I was given a revolution, or there's actually one other uh, there's one other unit I could get to radians. What's the other unit I could get to radians? Degrees. So. This is the unit you have to actually plug into the equation, but these units as well would, would be thetas, right? And then again, omega is radians per second usually, but if you were given something in RPM, you could get it to radians per second. Okay? So generally speaking, revolution or degree, you want to think about in terms of a theta. Uh, RPM, you want to think about in terms of omega. Questions on that. All right, I want to ask another conceptual question that's related. Um, so what I've got here, let me show you this animation first. Um, so what I've got here is a, uh, a turntable, and I'm going to sit two bugs on this turntable. Give it a second here to load. Uh, okay, I'm going to turn these off. So what I'm going to do here is I've got a ladybug there. I'm going to put a little beetle here, and I'm going to spin it, maybe. All right. So you've got two things. Is that the same way that I put it on here? No, I put the ladybug on the outside. Let's, uh, let's, let's set it the same way we had the other one. So we've got the ladybug on the outside, beetle on the inside. All right. So if this thing's, come on now, there we go. If this thing spins, I'm going to ask you a few questions about this, right? So they're both on the same turntable, right? And they're both spinning. Uh, here are the questions that I want to ask about it. So if that's the, the picture, let's just start with number one and number two. Which has the bigger V and which has the bigger omega, right? So tell your partner what you think. Which of those two bugs has the bigger V, which of those two bugs has the bigger omega? All right, Drake, which would you say has the bigger V? Tell me why. Yeah. But, yeah, that's the idea, right? So V is meters per second, right? Who travels more meters in the, in the same amount of time, right? The ladybug travels more meters. That makes sense. Everyone okay saying the ladybug has a bigger V. Uh, Malachi, who has a bigger omega? Yes, why? Yeah, so if you watch these two, right, they're both going to go through two pi radians. And it's the same amount of time, right? They're both going to go through one revolution the same amount of time. So they have the same omega, but the ladybug has a bigger V. Okay. Now, I want to just, if you take a look at your equation sheet for a second, right? Um, you've got this equation on there. I don't want to pull it up. You got this equation on there V equals R omega, right? Uh, that says the same thing, right? That says if these two bugs have the same omega, right, so they complete a revolution the same amount of time, they have the same omega, but the ladybug has a bigger radius. So you take a bigger radius times the same omega, you're going to get a bigger V. Okay? That makes sense? All right. The next one, uh, uh, the next couple are a little bit trickier. Um, 
So same situation, but my question is, uh, which bug has a greater alpha? Which bug, bug has a greater AT? And which one has a bigger AC? Let's just real quick talk about what those symbols mean. So alpha means what? Radial acceleration in radians per second squared, right? AT means tangential acceleration, right? And AC means centripetal acceleration. So, okay, with your partner, which of those has a bigger alpha, which has a bigger AC, which has a bigger AC? These both are going to uh, be going the same speed, so they're not changing their radians per second, so their radians per second squared is zero. So they're the same alpha, and it's zero. So let's which has a bigger AT? And the same AT and it being what? Yeah. Zero, yeah. And now what equation tells you that that has to be the case? It's uh, AT equals R times alpha. Yeah, AT equals R times alpha tells us that, yes, it has to be the same. The, the, uh, the alpha has to be the first. So AT on both have to be zero once again, right? Uh, I want to talk for real quick about what tangential acceleration is. Did I? I don't think I showed up here. I think I forgot until a uh, later period, right? When I say a tangent, right? So it's tangential acceleration to this tangent to the circle. An example of a tangential acceleration is if this thing is getting faster and faster and faster and faster, and faster right? That's a tangential acceleration because if you watch a point on this globe, right? It starts with a small velocity tangent and then it gets a bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and bigger tangent of velocity, right? So, uh, so that's why, um, so that's what I mean by tangential acceleration. And we are agreeing now that they both have no tangential acceleration because they are not changing their speed around. Questions about that? Sam, can I ask you about AC? Say, say again, you're, yeah, they both are the same omega. But we will hesitate for some some reason. Yeah. A bigger R, right? So if you look at the equation, AC equals R omega squared, right? If they have the same omega, but ladybug has a bigger R, right? Ladybug has bigger AC. Okay. Now, I want to talk about that. What is centripetal acceleration? And this is a little bit of a review. But how can, so what we're saying here is, once again, if I, if I take my globe, right, and I make my globe go at a, a approximately a constant rate, right? We just said that the AT was zero. How can the AT be zero, but there still be an AC? Yeah. Right, so you, okay, so mathematically we can describe it from the equations. That's true. That's true. So mathematically, this is what comes out of the equation. But I want to think about physically what does that mean? How can something be accelerating even though it's going at a constant speed? Yes, AC is what makes it rotate, right? Remember, acceleration is change in velocity. There are two ways to change velocity you can change speed or you can change. 
direction, right? The centripetal acceleration is how quickly you're changing direction. The tangential is how quickly you're changing speed, right? So what's happening here, if you think about this, right? If I'm going at a constant speed, AP is zero because I'm not changing speed, but I'm still changing direction because if you think about a point on this globe, right? This point on this globe right now is going that way, right? A moment later, it's going this way, right? So the, the point on this globe is constantly changing direction. Similarly, a point on that uh, the, the, the uh, ladybug, right, is constantly changing direction. Now, who is changing direction more quickly? And actually, let me uh, show the velocity vector here, right? If you take a look at the velocity vector, and I'll even show the acceleration vector too, right? So you can see in this case, right? You can see if, if you just watch it, right? The rate at which the direction that the ladybug V is changing is faster than the rate at which the, uh, um, the um, beetle's uh, direction is changing. If you just look at, right? Let me, that's kind of hard to explain. Let me. Let's look at this. Um, let me slow this down for a second. Uh, we're going to go just a little bit slower. Um, well, mm, not showing it the way that I want it to. I'm going to go faster, but I'm going to pause it, right? If you take a look at this, right, and you look in any small amount of time, right? So you should see that if you sort of think about how far that arrow moved from here to here, right? That's not as big of a move as this arrow, which moved from about here to there, right? So, so you can think about the, the one that's farther out as changing direction more quickly than the one that's closer. So that's just kind of an overview of the concepts we've talked about so far from a more conceptual perspective. Before I move on, anybody have any questions over the phone that they'd like to go over? Okay. 14. Yeah, this is okay. All right, 14, a 61 centimeter diameter wheel. So really what that's telling me is a radius of 30 and a half centimeters, so 0 .03, uh, 0.0305 meters. So uh, 61 centimeter diameter wheel accelerates uniformly about its center from 120 RPMs to 280 RPMs. in uh, 4.0 seconds. And part A is determine angular acceleration, right, which is alpha. Now, given the conversation we just had, what are you going to call these two? What symbols? Yeah. Yes. This is going to be omega naught and omega, but obviously we can't we can't use them as RPMs, so we're going to have to do a conversion. So again, this is the bottom of your equation sheet. I've got the RPM to radian per second conversion right here. Right, so 120 RPMs. We're going to say that there's 0.1047 radians per second in one RPM. Um, I might have 
calculator in MIA. I'm going to get these for me. Yep. All right. So there are a few ways we could do this, but if I just look at what the definition of alpha is, right? Alpha is just going to be delta omega over delta t, right? Or remember, delta is just final omega minus initial omega. So 29.32 minus 12.56 radians per second divided by 4.0 seconds. All right. Good so far, Becky. Questions about 14A. B, we do have to be a little bit careful about. Um, B says, find the radial and tangential components of linear acceleration. Uh, when I say, or when it says linear acceleration, linear is, uh, is this it means the same thing as what I said translational right so translational and linear are the same term but they mean the same thing right so if uh, part B is asking for the radial and tangential components they're looking for a t and a they call it radial and remember I said radial is just the same thing as centripetal right they call it radial because it points along the radius. We're used to calling that centripetal, right? If you look on the equation sheet, I actually wrote it both ways. Um, so I wrote it as centripetal and as radial, but they mean the same thing, right? So in essence, we're going to do AT is R alpha and AC is, um, what is it? R omega squared R. All right, this one's easy. Yeah. What's that? Okay, good. Yes, that is going to, that's going to do something when we go here. Yes. So give me one second. I'll, I'll deal with that in a second. But for this, right, the alpha is constant. So it doesn't matter what time, uh, the alpha is going to be constant. So here I'm going to have 0 0.305 meters times uh whatever you got there and that's going to be your at now at depends on alpha this is kind of what we were just talking about right your alpha isn't going to change right you got a constant angular acceleration so you're going to have a constant at but your centripetal force is going to change over time, right? Because it depends on omega. So the question is, what is the omega at two seconds, right? Now, there's a couple ways you could do this. Um, I think the easiest way might be to say, okay, well, the omega at two seconds, I can deal with using, um, what is it? I can deal with using Old Faithful, right? So it'd be omega naught plus alpha t squared r, right? So what I could say is I know what omega I started at. I know what the alpha is. T is going to be two seconds, right? I think that's the easiest way to solve that. Another way to solve it is you could say it says you're going from what? From uh, a 
thousand in the RPMs, uh, one twenty to two eighty RPMs in four seconds. So if you're going from one twenty to two eighty in four seconds, in two seconds, you're only going half that far. That'd be two hundred RPMs. So basically, what happens if you do omega naught plus alpha t, you're going to get whatever two hundred RPMs is in uh, radius per second. So that's another way to do it. <coughs> All right, what else? Can I move this? Automobile image, uh, automobile engine closed down from 3,500 RPMs to 1,200 RPMs in 2.5 seconds. Calculate again. We're going to start by calculating angular acceleration in part A. All right. So, what would you call these two, Emma? Yeah. So we're going to do this, and, and like we did before, we're going to have to do uh, 0.1047 radians per second in one RPM. And I'll leave that to you to do, but I think then you can use Old Faithful here, right? So you should know everything in there except alpha. And then in part B, it's asking the total number of revolutions the engine makes during this time. Now, again, if I'm looking for revolutions, what symbol do I want to find first? Theta, right? So what you do then is you'd uh, you'd use this and you'd find an equation, probably Old Faithful is the one that makes sense, most sense, but yours, um, it's not like yours, theta equals theta naught plus omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared, right? So then you could do that, you could get theta, that's gonna give you radians, and then you know there are two pi radians in a revolution, so you can convert something. Uh, I would say it starts at zero. So usually, uh, if you remember back when we were doing x equals x naught plus v naught t, we, we almost always set x naught equal to zero. So similarly, this time we are going to almost always set omega naught equal to zero. Not omega naught, uh, theta naught equal to zero. Okay. 23. Yeah, that's a good one. And if you do this, this uh, this will actually help you with uh, some of the other ones too. Um, any other questions on 17? I need to take this. All right, 23. A small rubber wheel is used to drive a large pottery wheel. The two wheels are mounted so that their circular edges touch. The small wheel has a radius of two centimeters. So I'll call that R1. Um, and accelerates, so alpha one is 7.2 radians per second squared. 
desk and is in contact with a pottery wheel. Radius 27 centimeters. Calculate the angular acceleration of the pottery wheel. All right. The question is if these, so the idea is that this wheel is spinning, right? And because it's in contact, it's going to make this wheel spin. Now, there's something that's the same on both of these. What is to be the same for both of them? What's that? Yes, why? Well, not omega, not omega. But but what but explain your thinking on that because you're you're seeing something important. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The tangential, either the tangential speed or velocity or the arc length have to be the same. Those all have to be the same. So here's the deal, right? Translationally, they're in contact, right? If it doesn't slip. This thing has to move translationally exactly as far as this one, right? So we could say that the arc length traveled by each of them is the same. But the rate that the arc length traveled is also known as the velocity. And then the rate that the velocity changes is known as the tangential acceleration. We know that AT1 is equal to AT2. Right? So this is true whenever you've got things that aren't slipping. Whenever you've got things that are touching and not slipping, they have to like, right? If, if if they if they went through different uh, different arc lengths, they'd have to slip relative to each other. Okay. So whenever you have things that aren't slipping, you can say all three of these things are true, right? So then what I can say is I can say R one alpha one is equal to R two alpha two, and that should be what you need to go from there. That's that good or you can keep going. It's fine. Um, look. Okay, so basically what's going to happen in B is you will now know what the alpha of 2 is, right? Um, it, it needs to get to a speed of 65 RPMs and you're going to convert that, right? Uh, probably it's starting from rest. Like if it says it's time to get up to speed, I'm going to assume that it means it's starting from rest. So zero RPM, right? And you want to find T. Um, so there should be an equation that has all those in it. I think it'll be an old, old page. All right, let's move on to notes. So in essence, what I want to do here is so we, we started this, uh, this uh, chart Right, so we did the chart for kinematics where we had concept, translational, rotational, and then comments. I want to kind of extend the chart, but we're going to talk about this in terms of instead of dynamics, we're going to talk about, uh, sorry, instead of kinematics, we're going to talk about dynamics. So once again, we will have concept translational. And uh, one of the things that I was realizing um, as I was helping people with questions, your book um, uses the term linear. So linear and translational mean the same thing, just like rotational and angular mean the same thing.
Okay. So if you recall where we started the last time is we started with the idea of position and we said that, okay, uh, we usually measure our position with X, but if we're rotating, we're going to measure our position with theta. And then we said, just like we're going to have a translational velocity V, we're going to have to have, have a rotational velocity called an omega, right? So we, and we kind of went on that pattern. The last thing we talked about was A, the tangential, or so the translational acceleration versus alpha, the, uh, the rotational acceleration. Um, if you think back to what we did like last semester, we spent two units talking about velocity, acceleration, position, all that. And then the next thing we did was we did Newton's laws and forces, right? So what we need to do is we need to uh, uh, determine the rotational analog of force. Um, except for the concept, I'm not going to call it force because uh, um, I'm going to call it uh, the cause of acceleration. Which translationally we called force, right? So forces were the thing that caused, in, uh, that caused regular acceleration, right? I want to talk about what causes angular acceleration. Um, and we're going to give it, well, let me give you a symbol first. We're going to call it uh, torque. Um, and we're going to give it the Greek letter tau. It kind of looks like a, a little bit of a weird T. So it's tau, and if you want the name for it, uh, it's torque, which is T-O-R-Q-U-E. I'm gonna think this is actually the easiest way to, to, to demonstrate this. So I'm gonna have you look back here for a second. Um, so the easiest way I think to demonstrate torque is uh, it's related to force, right? But there are two ways. So if, when I open this door, you don't think about it this way, but this door, this is actually a rotational motion, right? It's rotational motion because it's it's uh, going through a part of a circle where that's the center and like this is the radius, right? Um, so when we talk about torque, the radius is going to have a specific name. We're going to call it the lever arm. Um, and the idea is that the lever arm is basically how much, um, if you, if you, in the, in the everyday use of the word torque, right? You know how like a wrench, you want to have a bigger lever arm. The idea of a wrench is that you can put your torque further away and you can get more leverage. That's what we mean by a lever arm. But, what we're going to do is we're going to think about torque as um, as causing angular acceleration. So when I think about this, right, I got to have a force to make this door angularly accelerate. I got to give it a force, but I can give it a force in one of two areas, right? I can give it a force here, in which case it's not going to accelerate very fast, or if I gave the same force but I gave it here, right, I'm going to get more acceleration. So in other words. The two ways that I can increase the angular acceleration, or I can either increase how much force I give it, or I can increase this lever arm, right, this radius. Right? So what we're going to do then is uh, we're going to define this idea of torque. Um, let me think about it. I want to organize this the way that makes the most sense. I'm going to define it here. I'm going to define it as um, torque is defined as the radius times the uh, the perpendicular force. So F perpendicular. Now leave yourself some room because I'm gonna I'm gonna fill in a couple more. Uh, I think I'll have at least one more line in here uh, in a second. But I want to kind of talk a little bit more about torque. So if I draw out what it was that I was just doing, right? If you imagine like a bird's eye view of that uh, door, right? If you imagine here's the wall, here's a hinge, here's a door, right? 
So if I put the same force here, uh, and I'm going to have the, I'll call that R1, and I'll call this R2, okay? If I put the same force on two different areas of the door, I can say that the torque of one is going to be less than the torque of two because the radius is smaller, right? What that means in essence is that the angular acceleration of one is less than the angular acceleration of two. All right. Um, what are the units of torque? So if you just smash those two units together, what do you get? You got it? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we actually are going to call it meters newtons. Uh, and I want to, to be clear because technically, so the reason why we, we, we specifically call it meters newtons if it's a torque, mathematically that's the same as a newton meter, but we've already defined it. You remember what we defined a newton meter as? A newton meter is a joule, right? And a torque is not an energy. So by convention, even though technically meters newtons are the same unit as joules, by convention we are never going to measure torque in joules even though a joule is a newton. We're going to call it a meter newton instead of a newton meter. So that's what we're going to have for torque. Just like for force, we have units of newton. Um, now, just uh, the other thing we're going to do is uh, it's going to follow the same convention that we were using before. Namely, that if uh, if you push something and it goes counterclockwise, we're going to call that a positive torque. And if it goes clockwise, we're going to call it a negative torque. All right. So, question so far. So we define this idea of torque as the radius. Another, again, like I said, another word for radius is the lever arm. We define it as the lever arm times the force, right? Uh, if you recall, though, if we go back to Newton's laws. Uh, we talked about forces as causing acceleration, but there's another thing that Newton's law talked about. Other than Newton's law is talking about the cause of acceleration, what was the other thing it talked about? What's that? Inertia. Inertia. So the next concept that I want to talk about is I want to talk about um, inertia. Translationally, how did we f define inertia? What symbol measured inertia? This is weird because we don't usually think about this way. But what thing could we measure to figure out the inertia translationally? You know, what, what sorts of things have inertia? What sorts of things have more inertia? What? Sorry, I, I can't hear. Someone's saying something, but I can't hear. Go ahead, Malachi. Lighter things? lighter things have more inertia? No, less inertia. Yeah, lighter things have less inertia. Heavier things have more inertia. So in other words, mass was the thing that determined the inertia linearly, right? The analogous term that we're going to use in rotational inertia is something, so this looks like the uh, letter I, but it's really the Greek letter iota, capital iota. Um, and this is going to have, uh, um, there's two names for it. 
Uh, you can call it the moment of inertia. Or sometimes you can call it rotational inertia. Your book usually talks about moment of inertia, so that's that's the uh, the um, the term that I will try to use. But moment of inertia or rotational inertia, that's what iota, the Greek letter iota means. And I want to talk about uh, what that is then. So down here. <laughs> We're going to sort of, we're going to recast Newton's second law. Um, rotationally. So if you recall, Newton's second law as a, uh, as an equation was F equals MA. So what we're going to do, just because we can, is we are going to multiply both sides by R. Um, because if we do this, what's that? Torque. And then what we're going to do is we're going to say A, if you go back to your equation sheet, we can say that A, at least if I'm talking about tangential acceleration, A is going to be equal to R times alpha. So if I just simplify this, I'm going to have torque is equal to MR squared times alpha. And I can say, in other words, that torque equals iota alpha if we define iota as mr squared. So these are, uh, these are actually two equations we're going to use. So the way I want to think about this, right, is if you look at these two equations next to each other, they fall, they're very parallel to each other, right? You had the cause of acceleration is equal to the cause of inertia times acceleration. The cause of angular acceleration is equal to the cause of inertia times angular acceleration, right? So these two are exactly analogous formulas, right, where this is the connection, iota equals mr squared. All right, um, to kind of explain what physically the, the concept of, uh, of moment of inertia is, I like to think about it like this. So imagine I'm holding this meter stick and I, I can rotate it pretty easily, right? So in other words, right now, this, this meter stick has a pretty low moment of inertia, right? If I were to put giant, like, dumbbell on each side of this, It'd be a lot harder to do this, right? Why? Because I'm taking a mass and I'm putting it at a large radius, right? So if you if you get mass further and further and further from the radius, um, uh, the uh, the rotational inertia, the moment of inertia goes up, and it's harder to rotate. Okay. Any all right, let's do some practice before I go too much further. I'm going to hand this uh, this out. Uh, number one, we actually already did last class, uh, but I didn't get to it on a period two because I fired it today. So when you get this, uh, you can skip one because we've already done it. I want you to see if you can make any sense out of two.
and take a look at that and see what, what uh, you can make of number two. All right. You might see what I need to do here. Yeah, go ahead, Leo. So I, I could find the moment of inertia. Hmm. The goal here is, and, and, and we will do that in a second. I, I want to uh, treat this as just like a... Can I find this net torque? So two things for each of these. So I, I well, I see what you're saying. Okay, I guess I could if I found the moment of inertia, I could do this equation. And I could find torque. Yes, I think this is this is the one that's going to be easier in this case. I don't think we're going to know alpha, so we're not going to have enough information to do that. But so what we need, right, to use this equation is we need an R and an F. R is going to be easy enough to come by. How am I going to find my Fs? Gravity. Okay. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. So force of gravity, one, two, and three. So mg, what is that? 98 newtons. 196. 294, is that right? So, torque one, torque two, torque three are going to be R times F. So, the R here, and we're going to, uh, we want to find the R about this, this point labeled S. So what is that R? 70. So 70 centimeters, so 0.7 meters times 98. 0.4 meters times 196. 0.3 meters times 294. There's actually a cup, uh, before we actually solve that, there's actually one error we've got to deal with. Malachi, what is it? Yes. So remember, we're going to say anything that makes this thing go clock, counterclockwise is positive. Anything that makes it go clockwise is negative. So which ones are making it go counterclockwise? These two, like, right, if you think about this, right, these two are going to make it go counterclockwise. So these two are positive. This one's making it try to go clockwise. So this one's going to be negative. Okay. And again, what I'm doing here is this is just R times F.
All you need to see what you can do with B. So B is going to say, let's pretend that number three is not 30 kilograms. Let's decide what it has to be if we want it to hold or if we want it to balance the other two out, right? So part B is saying, A, uh, the first two masses, the 10 kilogram and 20 kilogram mass are the same, but I want to change the M3 to be whatever mass I needed so that it does not rotate. So see if you can do Anybody see how I might do this? Go ahead, Leo. Yeah, so if you think we need the net torque to be zero, right? So in other words, we would need torque one plus torque two. And, uh, well, this is minus, but also I'll say minus torque three, right? I need those to equal zero. So I need 68.6 .6 plus 78.4 minus torque three to be zero. Um, right, and then I know that the radius is 0.3 and times whatever the force is. Um, I think what I want to do, instead of just overloading you on things, is really uh, to, to do uh, question three, I really need to uh, uh, teach one more thing. Um, but I think I'd like to give you some time to practice this. Um, so uh, do me a favor, don't lose that paper. 
because I want to do question three next time. Um, but and then the other thing is what I'll say is uh, at this point you can't really do uh, eight five eight six, but you can do eight four. Um, so, so at this point you can do up to eight four on the syllabus, and I'm going to give you some time to work on that. Let me stop my report. Give a second.